So, um, yeah, hello, my name is Sonia Pahoki. Uh, hello. But you may know me as um, Sanja Pahoki. Um, I'm the head of photography at the VCA. Hello, I'm Kieran Robinson. Sometimes you might know me as Sanya Pahoki. <laughs> and I also <laughs> work in photography at the VCA with Sanya. Our lunchtime art forum is being held today on the lands of the Wurundjeri people, and we wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners. We would also like to pay our respects to, the, to their elders, past and present, and to Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. David Sequera couldn't be here today, so we have come to introduce you to today's speaker. Kent, Kent Wilson. Wilson. <laughs> um, so Kent Wilson is known for contemporary curatorial practice, research oriented engagement and a collaborative style. He co-founded Kind and Contemporary Inc. and co-directed the Kind and Contemporary Art Triennale. His recent role as senior curator at La Trobe University's Art Institute saw him conceive, develop, and deliver programming that pushed the parameters of gallery settings. Multi-site exhibitions that put context sensitivity and artist-led philosophies at the core of process are of a particular interest. Kent has produced exhibitions in public and private institutions, written for online and print publication, and sat on funding and assessment panels. He is also an artist, having graduated with a PhD from Monash University and has ex exhibited in commercial artist run and public galleries. Please, Please put, put your, your hands, hands together, together to warmly, warmly welcome, welcome Kent Wilson. Wilson. Terrific. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm mindful of the lights. Be seen okay. I don't necessarily need to be in the spotlight, but if people are online, hello online, I might like to see my face a little bit. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for inviting me along to talk with you today and with you. Um, it's really lovely to be back in Nam. I haven't been able to, be, to uh, visit very often in the last couple of years. Today, um, I've traveled down from Tungurung country um, and I really enjoyed that hour on the train traversing the landscape at speed. I live in Kyneton, as you probably gather, which is half a kilometer above sea level, just over the other side of a large mountain. I came down around the mountain, down onto the Great Melbourne Plain to arrive just over the river and a short distance from a giant bay. So yes, my name is Kent Wilson. And yes, I studied fine art at Monash University and for a brief moment shared a studio space with Kieran while we're doing our postgraduate. Um, I have exhibited drawings, paintings and sculptures at various places, but over time, there's a sort of logical consequence of my ideas about process and materials. I was really drawn to curating and directing. Although I consider myself more of an exhibition maker than a curator, now that I'm not even sure what the right terminology to name the work that many of us do as curators. So what you'll see uh, on the images running through while I talk are a selection of images from the Kind and Contemporary Art Triennial. Um, I'll just let them cycle through. There's a variety of different images from all the different artists that we've commissioned and exhibited um, across the two iterations that we've been able to produce so far, one in 2018, and one in 2022, just recently in March. So like uh, many of you will likely be, I'm really interested and possibly more interested in process than I am about outcome. But I do love outcome, outcome is wonderful. Uh, but I get a particular curious buzz out of process. And I, I think like strategically, that's the territory within which the most opportunities exist for developing and growing the industry. 
for contributing new languages and for affecting change. It's quite a privilege to have an opportunity to talk about the sort of work that I do. So I'd love to talk to you today um, about my favourite project, something I, toge I developed together with a group of people who live and work in the town of Kyneton, which is by the Borgham or Campaspe River, Kyneton Contemporary Art Triennial, which we call KCAT. Is, it's an event, but it's more important to us as a process. It's a commissioning model uh, that's designed to offer artists opportunity to explore their practice outside of any inherent expectations on their work and outside the given structure of the familiar arts architectures. So a quick overview. In 2016, six years ago, a group of 10 artists and curators met in my lounge room in Yaldwin Street in Kyneton we decided that we would set ourselves up as a committee and create these opportunities or create new opportunities for artists to make work, develop work and present work. So we did the formal thing of setting up ourselves as a non-profit incorporated organisation, which in a sort of bureaucratic uh, nature feels kind of like a daunting thing potentially, um, feels like something foreign to uh, creative practice, but um, it's a relatively simple process to undertake and sets you up to then seek out funding and resources to make arts projects happen. We applied for grants and started looking for partners to help us and to work collaboratively with mutual benefit. We also established some principles and crafted some sort of ethos of operations about how we would work. KCAT, Cotton Contemporary Art Triennial, serves as a catalyst to activate an authentic relationship between contemporary art and the social fabric of our community. The collective is dedicated to cultivating quality arts practice, meaningful community engagement and capacity building in regional Victoria. We work to bring contemporary ideas, artists and artwork to our hometown to inspire, to educate and engage our local community and its visitors as well as facilitate opportunities for artists and professional development for art, artists and arts workers. So one of the things there is the primary interest for us is what we do for art and artists and the audience and the community that we engage with um, is what's required to foster um, new work and new developments by artists. But our principal and prime interest is what we do for artists in the arts industry. So there was a, a variety of reasons why a group of these friends and peers self-organized at that time and in that particular place. One of them was the sheer energy that exists as a, as a result of having a high portion of creators in any one community. I've often sort of thought of our, our lives as being a sort of double conduit of consuming things, of consumption and producing things, production. At various times we consume more intensely, at others we produce more intensely. Sometimes we do a bit of both. Sometimes we do very little of either. But when there's a concentration of people living their lives productively with a sort of willed productive intention and all doing that together simultaneously, it's a certain like vibrationary potency that comes with that. I've heard, Brian Eno, you've probably heard this um, idea that the creative activity of artists and a genius in the past was attributed to single people or people of particular skills and prowess. But there's a thought that maybe uh, intelligence comes from and creative potency comes from a scene and genius comes out of groups of people working together, more a senior than a genius. And that's something we ascribe to. KCAT is an attempt to then choreograph that energy, to compose it into a form, and then use that to amplify more productivity, but also to amplify consumption. It's our resolute intention to center arts practice at the core of our work, which is easy to declare in a mission statement, and you'll see that regularly by organizations, but it's more important how it is enacted through actual behavior. So, as a way to ensure that, we set up our budgets in a way that ensures artist payments are the highest portion 
of costs in our budget. I've worked in institutions where artists are seemingly the lowest paid. And the whole reason any of us have a job in those institutions is because of the artwork that's being produced by the artists. So the way we've set up KCAT is that the artists get the highest proportion of costs. We gather as many resources as we can. And we have to, when we pass it off to conduct all the activities we do, artists have to get the most majority of those resources, those financial resources. Members of our community, uh, of our committee, sorry, of the collective are all volunteers and we create, write, produce and provide tech support as a gifted service. And I believe it's this generosity, 10 people working for free on top of their job and family commitments to assist artists in developing their practice. That generosity is one of the reasons that the model works so well. Now, there are problems, of course, with that. Volunteering in our industry is a double-edged sword um, and it can make it difficult for sustainability if everyone's volunteering all the time. We're already, already finding ourselves quite exhausted running to events um, and volunteering in that way. But the strength of this event does rely a lot on that volunteering commitment and that generosity becomes a value that, that is shared as part of the asset of that organisation and activity of what we do. Uh, collective decision-making in the team uh, each working to our own strengths and interests, centering arts labor, trusting in those we collaborate and work with. And I mean really foregrounding trust. In fact, facilitating situations in which trust can actually be asserted. So we invite artists to make any work they want. It doesn't have to be about a theme. It doesn't have to be a particular medium or concept. Artists are free to pursue any outcome and are encouraged to step outside any expectations of their work. It might be a chance to try a new medium or explore a new medium. It might be a chance to collaborate, to research, or recontextualize work in a different setting outside of the standard presentation and working environment. The fact that the art will be presented in a small regional town, so Kyneton is 66 minutes in on the train, it's just over an hour away from Melbourne, facts that we're presenting in a town like that across multiple sites in the town mostly sites too of lived experiences in the community non-traditional art sites by default puts location and site more significantly into play in the experience of that event we when we talk to the artists uh, in the commissioning and inviting process we offer the town as a itself, the whole town, um, its culture, its architecture, its ecology, as much as we uh, can help facilitate as a material and as an exhibition site. So we act as the facilitators of connection to the community as best we can. And we encourage artists to follow their own thread of interest. And we encourage a context sensitivity rather than a site specificity. And that's sort of variation in, in um, intent and focus is important to us. It's not site specific. It's not about kind or necessarily, it can be, but it's not necessarily a requirement. We just ask that the artists be sensitive to the context in which they show the work, which all artists should anyway, but this is a real opportunity to kind of um, amplify that aspect of, of working. We also stress that the art doesn't need to be, a, be about the town doesn't need to use any materials from the town and it can literally be about anything at all. We invite our artists to spend time on the ground though, if only to visit and to meet with us and meet the community in any way they like. It might just be buying a coffee at the cafe and spending night in an Airbnb. But we believe the act of breathing the air, walking on the ground, consuming the food and sleeping under the same sky in which their work will then be consumed is an important part of the project. The character of each triennial, of each KCAT, first one in 2018 and the following one just presented in March, as I mentioned, is really that quality of those events is really determined by the artwork that's produced, not by the themes, not by any directorial curation, but by the art that is created, produced and presented. The themes we give the events, so in 2018 was themed force fields, in 2022, it's themed holding the circle. We do apply themes to them, but the themes we give them are not actually exhibition themes as such, but descriptors of the project that's enacted in order to deliver them. 
The art that is conceived, developed and then presented to the public is what creates the flavor, the meanings and the vibe. Character of the art describes the character of the occasion. I mentioned audience before. KCAD is a structure that we use to drive a better connection between art and people. We are ambassadors for the value that art has for the strength and quality of society. We believe that art has a power to affect change. And KCAD is designed to foster connection with people and between people and particularly non-arts audiences. If we can share what artists are doing with more people, we know and have experienced that we can grow a greater appreciation of the work of artists in the community. We know if we share the work of great artists with aspiring artists, then that inspiration and that skills uh, development leads to an improved practice, improved self-confidence and an improved sense of connectedness to others. And another massive factor for us is kids. Part of our motivation to produce KCAT is to build something of quality that kids in country towns can experience within the lived, ex lived experience of their daily lives. Being regional, even the very term itself, regional, evokes a distance, particularly from a centre. These communities feel the consequence of connecting to an international portal in order to engage with the rest of the world or to infrequently travel long distances to a city in order to put themselves in contact with quality cultural experiences. But what if they could see, hear, touch, and experience wonderful creativity in their community? We want the kids of our community to get access to that because we do fundamentally believe that good art expresses something about the nature of the times, so it's educational, and it inspires imagin imagination, which is a highly productive quality. It's transformative in an almost biological imperative of human beings to educate ourselves, to learn about the world and to motivate ourselves, to inspire ourselves, to create, invent and discover and to do things better. We feel like exposure to art in this way is a sort of civic service for kids in country towns. We try and think about how the event is received as well. What's it like for the local butcher who never goes to museums, or a 12-year-old kid who lives on a farm and catches a school bus into Kyneton, or a lecturer from a university, or a tourist from overseas. Artists as well are another distinct sort of audience we consider when we make decisions about what we're doing. KCAT tries to demonstrate, demonstrate ways of working, even ethics of working. The way we prioritise spending is important. The way we talk about the artwork to our audiences, uh, to funders when we're pitching, to partners who we want to work with, and our army of 75 volunteers, the way we talk and share information with all of those people reflects our art-centered logic, the supportive context that we try and create, and that advocates for the impact of the work being produced by artists. I sometimes think about the way we talk about or think about the manufacturing industry. While there's an election on, there's often talk of how we can better strengthen our manufacturing industry. And what does it mean to be making things locally? Um, what, does it mean, what does it mean to um, respect the labor of local people working and creating stuff? And what does that mean for their identity and the products that they might be able to consume? Um, in some ways to me, artists are like discrete industries. They are micro manufacturers, bespoke output for broad reach. Coordinating this local manufacturing base. Oh, I think the slideshow might have ended. If you, if June, you can just recycle it through again, and some of those images will just repeat. So, artists is a manufacturing base. Coordinating this local manufacturing base, drawing together a network of these micro manufacturers, even in a temporary choreography, is a vehicle for leveraging impact. KCAT is an attempt at demonstrating that artists are the drivers of this value and this power. We present the event with an intention to show artists how amazing and important their work is. 
how valuable creative endeavor is to communities and the lived experiences of people's lives. I wanted to also touch on uh, one of the sort of operating tenets of KCAP. It's a three-sided triangular network of relationships that we think about focused on art, architecture, and audience. It's a sort of like guiding trinity that I've always used as a lens to approaching working on art projects. And it's a way of sharpening, sharpening consideration on what is made and by extension, who's making it, where it is made and where it's shown or consumed and who is witnessing the work, who's consuming it. It enables us to really focus on those three aspects in every decision we make we run through consideration of how those things work individually and how the relationship between those things works. And by attending to these with care and criticality, we create the circumstances that foster magical moments. They elicit the strongest intensities, intensities that resonate with a sustained energy that echo and continue. By ensuring that there is this connective relationship across these aspects, is built on an authenticity and care, we ensure and foster and birth quality outcomes. Or more, we are midwives for the birth of those outcomes. So art, now I've spoken a little bit about art now, sort of art-centered focus and how artists are um, invited to make whatever they like, which is a way of foregrounding art and the support that we offer to artists. And it's our commitment um, to this part of the triumvirate for art. The selections of the individual artists that we invite, the composition of the group of artists for each event, and the type of work they normally make, all things that we consider very carefully. All these things are considered also in their own right, firstly in their own right. Um, what is good art right now? Who's making it? And then we consider its relationship to architecture, either in its production or its presentation, both, um, and to audience, how that's going to interact with an audience. And we always let, always let artists take the lead and determine for themselves what work they want to undertake and present. Now for architecture in that triangular prism, what we mean by that is the platform for conducting or presenting the work, not just built architecture, but a whole variety of structural platform um, foundations upon which the work is created. It could be buildings, gardens, bridges, streetscapes, Instagram feeds, website, the council, the committee itself as a tool or instrument, the ecology of Kyneton. They are, that's the architecture. And as a consequence of being a regional event with invited artists and visiting attendees, the fact of our regionality is so entrenched in the character of the event that sight becomes experiential on a similar register as the art. Experiencing, of, ex experiencing the event is as much a tour of the town and the region as it is a walkthrough of an expanded gallery over many spaces. Because of this, we think carefully about the nature of the various architectures that house the art, and deliver the art. And we've discovered that by searching for relationships between art and architecture, town itself invariably delivers appropriate locations for the work. And we see these coincidences and connections as an evidentiary expression of our faith that we have in this process. If you set the right parameters, you establish the conditions of the field, then within that field, magic happens. If not magic, then powerful forces of joy, surprise, intrigue, wonder. In other words, art. And you can foster it, summon it, embolden it, and amplify it. In the first instance, we encourage artists to develop a sense of the right architecture for them and their work. A great example of how this played out was in 2018 um, with Georgie Mattingly, who we commissioned, and she's interested in the industries of communities. So she came in and she thought the best way to learn, particularly industries that have faded away or died over time. So when she came to Kyneton as part of the first KCAT, 
she worked, uh, she wanted to engage with the living repository of that knowledge. Who knows about those industries that have, that were once thriving aspects of the town that are now absent or gone. She thought the best people to ask about that would be people in nursing homes, people that grew up last century that did the work, that understand the town, have seen the change over time. So she wanted to be an artist in residence at a nursing home. So we helped facilitate that and put her into uh, Bupa Aged Care. That would have been 2017. She worked as an artist in residence and ran classes in order to uh, familiarize herself and to become familiar with the residents and elicit their trust in getting um, learning information about the town. As a consequence of those discussions, she learned about a giant foundry that had operated in town just after the Second World War and was a high employer of people in the town. Um, it is, has been, at the time, had been empty for decades, this giant factory um, that the whole the variety of people in the town uh, had never seen inside or had any awareness of what even was in it before because it had closed down 20, 30 years prior. And that discovery and learning about that industry and engaging with the people that worked in that industry um, meant that that site itself became the appropriate and perfect site for her to exhibit her artwork. So she and uh, one of our uh, committee members, Claire, Claire Needham, uh, went to speak to the landlord of that property who'd recently just bought it, a person from Sydney, and convinced them that we could use that site to exhibit her work. So the content of her work and the character of her work um, was appropriate and amplified by presenting it inside uh, the site of where that information had come from. It was a really wonderful project. Um, it also meant that the one of the most exciting aspects of that project was seeing the elderly people of town. She even took a, a tour group from the nursing home on a bus to visit the work site, to the work site and the exhibition site. And the sense of pride and um, felt respect and understanding of the lived experiences of these older people who've seen the town change so much and had thought they had sort of contributed to an industry that was dead and no longer contributed to society that they could see that there was an interest in their work, that their identity was important. The feeling of um, joy you could see in those people was great, it was really captivating. And it was enhanced by the fact that it was in that foundry environment and people could really feel and understand what it was like to work in that environment. And the work that Georgie produced touched on some of those elements. And an example of where the town itself coughed up a venue that was appropriate for the work was in the recent um, outing, Stephen Rawl, um, who was making work about um, understanding his place as a First Nations, perhaps evolving elder, the responsibilities and pressures on him um, as an artist and how he is seen through the lens of a First Nations artist. Um, so there was a lot of thought and care about the transfer of cultural knowledge and his responsibility for transferring it and being educated and educating in that role. And so we looked at a few sites and one of the sites that came up was an old schoolhouse, um, which had been um, run by a, a woman called Ray Begg. Um, most of the town had actually assumed Ray Begg was a, a man and learning the, that this was a pioneering woman who'd had this impact on the town was, again, really wonderful for the town's sense of pride and, and civic understanding of, uh, of its identity. Um, but she ran that as a school and then when she'd finished running it as a school, educating young children, she then transferred the entire property, which is a couple of acres and the schoolhouse building um, over to the service of aged care to look after people who were vulnerable, low socioeconomic um, sort of capacity to look after themselves. So that site was a site of education for young people and also of caring for old people. And so to have Stephen Rawls work in there that spoke about education, um, his work was about also raising his child and at the birth of his child. So to have that at a site where there was education and young people involved and the sort of respect and care of the elderly when we're talking about the transference of cultural knowledge it was just a perfect sign. It was as if the town itself coughed that up to us as if they sort of came rushing to each other to meet each other. I've touched on uh, audience uh, already and our approach to audience engagement. The way we think about our local community as an audience is important artists as an audience, the arts industry really as an audience and kids. Perhaps something I didn't touch on 
is the public and cultural programming that we see as a critical part of the Folsom event. And I mentioned it here in consideration of audience, mostly because we focus the intention of this programming on sharing knowledge and skills and on facilitating community connection. The events, these events have the potential to um, not only share artwork that inspires and reveals truths and asks intriguing questions, they have the capacity to create situations that bring people together. And after two years of pandemic and isolation, to see that enacted was really beautiful. Um, perhaps the clearest way to give an example of how that happens through KCAT is via the supporting network of volunteers that we have. Because our event is across multiple sites and there are talks, workshops, performances, gigs happening as well, we need a massive team of volunteers. This time we had 75 volunteers helping us invigilate sites and manage events. And these were in large part, local artists or arts interested and community minded people from the region. But there are also others who come up from Melbourne, some even traveled into state to assist. Having so many volunteers all working together, 75 people across the town, sharing shifts in pairs with people they didn't know before, to greet visitors to installations in halls, sheds, botanic gardens, meant dozens of new friendships and social connections were fostered. For the artist cohort of this group of volunteers, this was a valuable connection and professional development opportunity. For most, it was simply an occasion to share a collective experience with others. It offers real community and individual well-being for a small town. So all the decisions that we take to produce the event, even administrative decisions and planning, are run through the consideration of this triangular prism of art, architecture and audience. Now, mindful of time, so we've hit 12.52. What time would you like to start for? That's all right. What time do we finish? 1.15. Okay, cool. Um, I'll just talk just very quickly about it's kind of um, paradoxical that we put arts practice and arts at the center of what we do. And I've spent this talk talking about the model that we've produced and what the committee does. So I'll just talk, just uh, I'll pick out maybe one project from the recent, um, recent KCAT that gives an, an idea about the process that we undertake, the power and majesty of the artwork that's created in that circumstance and itself will give a sort of reflection and uh, insight into the broader working processes of, of KCAT. Um, so I'll talk about, um, talk about Eugenia Lim's artwork. So many of you might know Eugenia Lim's work. She's very much interested in labour and she's interested in systems. So when she came to town, she was thinking about how the town operated, also particularly during the pandemic, what was the functioning of the town, what were people having to do? What was the sort, of, the sort of work they have to undertake to keep a town cohesive and operational? So with a lot of, um, well, a lot of thought and the occasional opportunity to come out and visit and spend time at the town, um, Eugenia started to think about the uh, transfer station, the TIP, which was still operating entirely out throughout the pandemic. Uh, whose function and work became um, critical into ensuring the consistency of the functioning of a, of a town. Um, and she started to think about how, how that structure, how that sits into the broader structure of society, what the value, what value we put on that type of labor. So she reached out to one of the council workers at the tip, Stephen Bolter, a really interesting guy, and the mayor, of, of Macedon Rangers Shire Council, uh, Councillor Jennifer Anderson, who's really wonderfully supportive of the arts. And she uh, worked with them to choreograph a dance performance at the tip. So she had Stephen Bolter, a fairly low paid, low profile council worker, whose job is fundamentally important to the operations of the community and the mayor whose uh, con connotations of power and control and authority over the town is clear by her title. Um, and herself as the third person in that arrangement as the artist interceding into that environment, investigating those relationships and those considerations of those materials, tip, council workers, 
even the art event itself becomes a factor at play about what sort of engagement you're going to have in that circumstance. So she choreographed a dance performance, undertook it at the tip um, and had the worker, had uh, Stephen, Jennifer and herself dressed in these wonderful, oh, I them just then, uh, wonderful golden um, outfits. And then we presented that work. The video is absolutely fantastic. She worked with Tim Hillier and uh, Zoe Scoglio for sound. Um, the outcome of that video was fantastic. And the site that we then chose to present it in, in thinking again about the way we try and draw and amplify the relationship between the site of the exhibition itself um, and the content of the work. We did want to show it at the tip, but that was difficult with occupational health and safety and uh, having audiences go onto the tip site. We decided to show that at the Freemasons Hall. Now the Freemasons have a um, sort of, you know, connotation about a power, um, about authority and structure. Um, it's a, a sort of a traditional um, ceremonial um, environment. And so for a choreographed performance of dance that included the mayor and a council worker uh, um, and an artist in these sort of rites and rituals seemed like the perfect and was the perfect place to present the artwork. So that's an example of, of how those elements work together. And again, it was Eugenia's drive, interests, um, capacities for curiosity that drove all of that, that didn't have any uh, bearing for us, whether it uh, matched or related to the theme, it didn't matter what process she undertook or who she was going to work with, we just worked to help facilitate her curiosity and intention with following that thread of thought through the end. Um, I'd encourage you, if you find uh, this interesting, to have a look at our website. We have a whole variety of information there uploaded recently for um, the most recent event. Um, and there's also a really great book um, that was designed by um, Hope Lumsden Barry, a really wonderful book um, from the first event that gives an insight into the first event. But I'm mindful it will allow a bit of time for questions. Um, so thank you so much for your time. And yes, if we wanted to move to questions next, I'd be happy to have the discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you. That, that, that was really amazing. I had the um, opportunity to visit the last um, training. It was, it was a fantastic event. But just to, um, I was just thinking a couple of things. One, one to hear about, you know, the fact that you guys are able to just organise and do this off your own bat. You, you weren't waiting for someone to hand you a whole lot of money or to commission or, or get you going, but you just were able to do it yourselves and work it in reverse. It's such a wonderful model to hear and sort of encouraging for us as, um, you know, people entering that system and, and knowing that you don't have to wait for mm -hmm. the opportunities. Um, but also the enormous generosity that you, your, your group, is, your committee is, is doing in sort of empowering uh, and giving off to other artists the privilege, the, the, the process of making work uh, as opposed to the process of administrating work and you guys doing that as volunteers is really amazing. So I think I just think it's great. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I just want to throw, throw it open to, to any questions that anyone might have. Um, June, I believe, or Sanya may have a microphone. We just want to, um, if you have a question, please speak into the microphone because um, people in Zoom can't hear you like us. Just what, while we're waiting, I have a question. Um, yes. <laughs> it's about the process of selection oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. and how you guys go about because uh, you, you know, there's obviously a, you know certain, only a certain amount of artists um, that you, you select but how do you go through that process of yeah. choosing who and asking and, and that yes that's a really good question so um, it's in keeping with our collective decision making um, where we all sort of share input and assessment and rigour so uh, amongst the 10 of us, we just bring artists that we think would be appropriate or would like to work with or have seen that are making interesting work. Um, so we start off with quite a few actually, and we just, we just meet and talk about them, share insights into their work. So a few of us are curators and have worked with artists. And then we see um, through that experience of working with those artists or being attentive to their practice, things that we think would be appropriate for this type of um, project. So yeah, we really just um, bring 
all of us bring in artists that we think would be appropriate and talk about them amongst ourselves. And then also there, there comes a, a, a necessity to think about how that works sort of cohesively. So we try and again, not to have any sort of curatorial or directorial kind of oversight on that, but it is important for us to have a mix of artists from different states. So one of the things we wanted to do was pro provide a, a, an occasion where artists could meet um, artists from across the country, um, also in an unusual setting. So rather than maybe meeting at major events in major cities, they can meet in a sort of a quieter, um, less um, intense environment and have an opportunity to engage in conversation and share audiences as well across those lines. We try and um, include, a, we always include local, a couple of local artists because we wanted to show and profile the quality of work that's being produced outside of the city centres. So there's sort of, yeah, some aspects that we look for in those characteristics. Um, it's very important to us that we try and ensure that there's a broad uh, depth of diversity as, as much as possible. It's only a small group, 10 artists, um, but that's also a factor as well, that smaller group so that we can, uh, there's 10 artists and 10 on the committee so that we can help ensure that there's a supportive and um, uh, an environment of relationship. Um, we you could, and it, you see it sometimes in triennials and biennales that there's a, 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 a grab as many as you can and, and pick a work from here and here and here. Um, but one of the things we wanted to do was have an environment where the artists were well supported by a sort of a, a supportive team and each artist had a producer that they worked with. Yeah. Um, so even those things sort of um, go towards our decision making about which sort of artists to work with, which of the artists that would benefit from that yeah. sort of in, um, engagement. And so that also feeds in a little bit to our, our thoughts around artists who are going through a kind of development of their practice. And we think that this is a, a model for the artists that are doing that, or perhaps have maybe uh, worked in one medium dominantly, predominantly, but occasionally shoot off something a little bit different. And we think, well, maybe those artists would benefit from coming to us and they can explore that side shoot a little bit more. So we think about those sort of things as well. But we're considering what to do with the model going forward, because one of the issues with that is that, it, especially over time, that kind of um, embeds a particular power and gatekeeping over whose artists is, you know, it's easy to um, imagine that the, your networks of connection, the people that I know and I've worked with or Claire knows that she works with, sort of a limited pool. So we're aware that, that over time, that's probably gonna need to be cracked open to let people in. Um, and I'm a big believer too, that having come to art very, sort of not very, later in my life, <laughs> A whole different sort of corporate career in the 20s, went back to art school at 30. I'm aware that there's people out there who are creative practitioners or even interested in art, but they haven't been exposed to it and had that opportunity. Mm. So, you know, there might be an absolutely brilliant sculptor in a back shed somewhere that we don't know about and that won't get um, sort of noticed. Yeah. Um, so an opportunity for, those, for people to share their work with us and be included offer their work to be considered in that showing as well is what I think we might have to start considering as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Terrific, that's really great. Um, got a website I'll share with you later. Okay. <laughs> um, are there any, are there any other any questions from anybody? I've got a question about um, experiences. I'm thinking there's been a lot of changes in the scene in the last time to now in 2022. Particularly with the COVID and yeah. um, and people moving out to the tree change and yeah. the tree change. There's definitely a different way to talk about your reflections on the relationships. Yeah, yeah, there definitely has, and there certainly is a movement of. I mean, I'm sort of part of an early wave of people that moved out of that city. I moved out in 2011. It was becoming difficult to afford spaces, and I was studying my PhD, so I moved out, and a whole bundle of us discovered when we were having house parties or meeting at the cafe. But a whole wave of people have moved out of the city. Um, a lot of us looking for that space or you could rent a place with a shed and you could have a studio in the shed. Um, and that's still really continuing a pace now, um, particularly also Castlemaine, sort of they're leaping over to a whole new wave of people going to Castlemaine. So that, yes, is definitely something that's an ongoing change, changes the nature of the community. Um, one of the things we really noticed and as a consequence of the pandemic was in the first event we, and the, the sort of, philosophies I've spoken about, we really want to engage an embedded relationship between the artist, the artwork and the community and the environment. Really difficult during the pandemic. Um, and it, the way that manifested itself was that as a result of artists not being able to be in town, perhaps not being able to do more of the performative 
or um, site engaged work, mostly working remotely. Um, a lot of video work was produced. Um, so we had a higher portion of video in this iteration than we did in the first. Um, and so that made, makes me reflect on how artists practice over these couple of years have had to modify their um, practice, you know, their methodologies and the mediums that they choose to work with. Um, so that's, yeah, had a, will, will have had over the entire sort of creative community an impact on what we have been able to produce, and what tools we can use. Um, it may have pushed more people into a particular medium. It might have pushed people away from a particular medium. Um, and also, too, I think a, a consequence of being isolated from each other and a feeling, I think, amongst the arts community that we were abandoned a little bit during the pandemic and fractured. Um, what we really noticed at the event was this real desire for this community connection um, and understanding that you know, we're not isolated in our homes, cut from any access to work and pay. Um, there are many more of us collectively together. We miss those opportunities of going to events and, and performances and feeling that shared, even if we weren't conscious of it, we all did it with a group of people and we always knew you know, our tribe was around. Um, but that was taken away for a long time and, and not only taken away, it was felt like it had been decimated to a degree. Um, and so that urging for connection and collaboration seems to be strong as well. So I'm kind of interested to see how that, those changes to medium and, and methodology and that desire for a more connected practice or connected relationships with others might then sort of evolve and what the next sort of outcomes of those characters might be. Is there a question? Yeah. Um, I think there might be a lovely QA question. Yeah. Um, um, so there's, there's one, one question, um, which is, um, from Okay. <laughs> Oh, okay. So, uh, Chris is saying, how important is the role of arts education system in creating a healthy, thriving arts culture? Ah, an education system. <laughs> <laughs> education expert thing. Well, yeah, world class <laughs> education system. Um, education is critically important. Um, whether that's a systemic ed education through institutions, or whether that's education that is conducted not in an institutional setting. Um, I don't think, well, it matters, of course, but there's a consideration of education itself. Um, systems obviously are able to be coordinated and leverage resources and embed process, which is fundamentally important. Um, but education is, Key. Art itself, to me, art is education. The whole seeming biological urge that humans have for us is to make something and show it to someone else and have that person go, wow, like it looks great, like it makes me feel good or it makes me think differently about the world. That, that is educational. So those ensuring that there's a process for ensuring those moments is what's really fundamentally important i think and naturally education systems and world-class education systems um, are important for fostering that um, but i think it's more about education itself than the tools there's a variety of different tools to instigate educative educational um, occasions Terrific. Um, Thanks, Kent, so much for today for coming down and presenting this and the generosity of the whole thing. And please keep doing it. <laughs> um, it's been great uh, going to the last one. Um, can we just give Kent one last uh, thank you and thank you.